Today, I'm providing an update on what we know about COVID-19 and people with diabetes. We have some, but not a lot of data, and the data that we have suggests that people with diabetes are actually not at increased risk for catching the novel coronavirus, but once they become infected, they may do less well, particularly if they're in an ICU setting. However, we don't know if there are any differences between people with type 1 versus type 2 diabetes or in people who are well controlled versus those who are less well controlled. We do know that younger people as a whole do better than older people and the more comorbidities present, such as cardiovascular disease and chronic kidney disease, the higher the risk of mortality and doing poorly. Historically, we do believe that people with higher glucose levels are likely to be at a greater risk for infection than those with more normal glucose levels. This is because high glucose levels can inhibit white cell function, and we obviously want our patients to be as well controlled as possible in order to help them do better. I have now seen patients with diabetes who have been infected with COVID-19 and have heard cases of many others. In my personal practice, no one with type 1 diabetes has developed COVID-19, but I have seen a number of people with type 2 diabetes who have had it. What I know for sure is that I can't predict this virus. I have had people who've had every known risk factor for a poor outcome do incredibly well, and those with fewer risk factors do worse than I expected. I've seen families where everybody was infected in families where only one family member became ill. However, there are some patterns that emerge. Unscientifically, I divide my patients into three groups of severity of illness, mild, moderate, and severe. Mild are those where COVID-19 is a slightly annoying head cold and nothing more. Moderate is where people feel miserable. They're feverish, they have muscle pain, they have headaches, their lungs hurt, they cough, they feel wretched, but they don't need to be in the hospital and they survive. And then there are those who have severe cases who do end up hospitalized and some of those patients end up in the ICU. In terms of diabetes management, it is those in the moderate category where we really have to do our most aggressive outpatient care. We don't want these patients to end up in the hospital, if at all possible. The biggest issue I deal with is dehydration because my patients are febrile and they're often anorexic and don't wish to eat or drink much, so I really have to encourage hydration. I've also seen patients where their glucose levels are lower than normal, which is different from what I'm used to seeing in patients with infection although some patients do become hyperglycemic. So I think glucose monitoring is incredibly important in patients with COVID-19. My first step in all patients who are on an SGLT2 inhibitor is to stop the drug at the first sign of symptoms. I have already had a lean person with type 2 diabetes on an SGLT2 inhibitor go into DKA when they developed COVID-19, so this is very important. And this patient had already stopped their SGLT2 inhibitor for a day when they became quite ill. There are practitioners, such as my dear friend, Dr. Earl Hirsch, who suggest that we stop SGLT2 inhibitor therapy in all people with type 1 diabetes who are using them off-label because it increases the risk for DKA. I haven't done that in my patients except those where I feel like they're either on too low a dose of insulin or seem to me at higher risk for ketoacidosis than others. But my patients who are able to test for ketones and connect with me, I've kept on their SGLT2 inhibitor, but I suggest monitoring this on a case-by-case -case basis. In my patients with type 1 diabetes, I make sure they are prepared with glucose-containing fluids at home, and I also make sure they're able to give injected insulin. I also make sure that they have ketone test strips at home and some sort of antiemetic so they can keep down fluids. I obviously don't want anyone going into the hospital 
with DKA. There has been an issue in hospital where patients on insulin drips can't get hourly blood glucose readings because the staff doesn't have enough PPE to go in and out of patient rooms to do the testing. So I encourage patients with type 1 diabetes and those with type 2 diabetes on insulin to prepare a kit that they could bring with them to the hospital. And this kit, in my mind, includes testing supplies if people are doing self-monitoring of blood glucose, and sensors if people are on a sensor. People need to remember such details as bringing charger cables so that they can charge their iPhones and their iPads, and anything else they may need to help self-monitor their glucose levels if hospitalized. I think this is particularly important now because family members aren't allowed into hospitals to bring the pieces that someone may have forgotten at home. So just remember, be prepared to do self-monitoring of glucose levels in the hospital if you happen to end up hospitalized. In people with type 2 diabetes who are on insulin secretagogues and or insulin, I have been needing to lower the dose of medication and in some cases stopping it altogether. So again, self-monitoring is important. As patients recover from their COVID-19 infections, they may still not feel much like eating and have relative anorexia. So there have been some cases where I have held the GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy for a week or two after the illness is resolved just to make sure my patients return to their fully normal baseline state. The most important advice I tell patients is to reach out to us, their healthcare team, if they need us. None of us want anyone to go in the hospital, but there are patients who do develop DK where they can't keep down fluids who need to be hospitalized, and patients shouldn't wait because you don't want the DKA to become even more severe by the time they're admitted. And there are others who have severe COVID-19 infection who do need to be evaluated and hospitalized. We all need to keep in mind that most people are going to be okay with or without diabetes, although tragically some will die. As a healthcare provider, I am encouraging my patients to use this time to take extra good care of themselves, to learn to optimize their diabetes control when not being distracted by going out to social events or out to dinner or having to go to work. I think we are helping our patients establish a new baseline that will hopefully translate into sustained health over time. Please be sure to take care of yourselves and your families as well as your patients. Be well. This is Dr. Ann Peters for Medscape.